It has been nearly 27 years since 15-year-old Channy Shiverdecker disappeared after basketball practice in Alexander City, Alabama. Nearly 27 years since her body was discovered at an abandoned lumber yard and nearly 27 years without answers for her family. On December 9, 1994, Chani attended girls' varsity basketball practice, which was being held at Radney Elementary School in Alexander City, Alabama. Around 6.30 p.m. as practice ended and other girls were picked up by parents or took the school bus back to their high school, Chani stayed behind waiting for a ride. Her friends and family would never see her alive again. Welcome to Bitter Endings, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, J.R. Erickson. In Bitter Endings, I'll bring you stories of those taken too soon, the silent many who no longer have a voice through which to seek justice. The Bitter Endings podcast is sponsored by My Fiction Novels. The Northern Michigan Asylum series are novels that weave together paranormal aspects with murder mysteries, and they are all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com or at jrerickssonauthor.com. They are in ebook paperback and audiobook. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Bitter Endings podcast. Before we get into the episode about Chani Shiverdecker, I want to mention that I spoke with her stepmother, Gloria. Gloria was in Chani's life from the time that Chani was just a little girl, less than two years old, and Gloria was very much a mother to Chani. Chani lived with Gloria and her father Howard for the majority of her life, and Gloria has been an advocate for Chani and has been fighting for justice in the murder of her daughter for nearly 27 years. Although most of my research came from newspaper archives that were reported around the time of Chani's disappearance and in the years since, I've also interspersed some of Gloria's memory of that time as well as her perception of what may have happened to Chani all those years ago. Chani's case is unsolved. It's a devastating story and one that honestly has left me with several sleepless nights since I first started looking into it. Please share it. I don't usually ask this on the podcast, and honestly, it's great anytime you share an unsolved episode. But my hope for this episode is that someone somewhere will realize that they saw or heard something back in 1994 that might bring light to who murdered Chani Shiverdecker. Perhaps they even know who the person is that committed this crime, and for whatever reason, they were previously afraid to come forward. If so, it's time to ease the suffering of Chani's family. So again, please consider sharing this episode. This was a 15-year-old girl with her whole life ahead of her. And I think as you hear more about her in today's episode, you will come to feel similarly to how I felt in reading about her case. It, it really is heartbreaking. It has really seemed in the years since Chani died that there has been a, a lack of coverage and a lack of urgency around finding the perpetrator who did this. And that's not to say 
that investigators don't care or the media doesn't care. It's just that for some reason, there are certain cases that get all of the attention and others that that just sort of fade away. And Chani's is definitely one of the latter. So again, please consider sharing today's episode. The more people who hear it, the greater the likelihood that someone who knows something will hear it too and hopefully come forward. Thank you. Chani Martria Shiverdecker was born on May 26, 1979 in Illinois. Chani was a special child. She was born with albinism, which is the condition of being albino, and she suffered from vision loss as a result. She was considered legally blind. Though she could see to an extent, she had issues with depth perception, and her eyes were extremely light-sensitive. Chani's eyes were so light-sensitive that she was unable to open her eyes outdoors until she got her first pair of glasses at 18 months old. This condition also caused Chani's hair, eyelashes, and eyebrows to be white. Albinism is a genetic disorder, and Gloria mentioned that Chani had an uncle and another family member who suffered from this condition as well. Though Chani's biological parents, Howard and Tina, were married at one time, when Chani was quite young, again earlier than two years old, Howard and Gloria began their relationship, and it was with them that Chani would spend most of her life. Chani also had a brother who was two years older than her, named Chris, and later, Gloria and Howard would have a son of their own named Levi. Chani was an adventurous child who did not allow her handicap to get her down. Gloria described her as a daredevil. When Chani was four, she tried to teach herself how to ride her brother's two-wheeler. She rode down a hill and crashed into a tree, but tried and tried again until she could do it. Chani was a doer. She played volleyball, basketball, bowled, and swam. She refused to allow her vision troubles to stand in the way of living her life. An organization in Illinois tested Chani every year to make sure she could attend regular public schools, and she was always able to do so, though she needed special books due to her vision issues. Though middle school was tougher for Chani during those years when kids can be especially cruel, Chani's strong group of friends saw her through the hard times. She enjoyed eating pizza, babysitting, spending summers with her mom, sewing, shopping, and singing in the chorus. In the final months of Chani's life, change was underway in her family. Howard Shiverdecker, Chani's father, was facing instability in the job market and frequent layoffs in Illinois. He had a dream of opening a combination golf, tackle, and bait shop, and an opportunity arose in Alabama that made that a possibility. Both Chris, who was 16 at the time, and Chani, who was 15, were given the choice to either stay in Illinois with their biological mother, Tina, or move with the rest of the family to Alabama. Chris had agreed to the move south, but initially the plan for Chani was to stay behind in normal Illinois and live with her mom. She usually spent summers with her mom, hanging out with one of her best friends who lived next door and attending volleyball camp. Tina also worked at a university that offered a special program that Chani could enroll in after she finished high school so that she could get her college degree. Gloria mentioned that Chani wanted to work with children. She would someday maybe have opened a daycare or worked with children with special needs. However, for some reason, in the weeks before the Shiver Decker family moved south, Chani decided to join them. In October of 1994, Chani, along with her dad, stepmother, and two brothers, moved to an apartment in Alexander City, Alabama. For a period of time, Howard returned to Illinois to continue working so that the family had health insurance. He officially moved to Alabama just weeks before Chani disappeared. Alexander City, known as Alex City, is located about 70 miles southeast of Birmingham in Alabama. 
It was also a pretty different home from what Chani was used to. Her hometown in Eureka, Illinois, had only 5,000 residents, whereas Alex City was nearly three times the size, with almost 15,000 residents. Chani and her brother Chris enrolled at Eureka High School, and much to Chani's delight, she made the girls' varsity basketball team. Previously, she'd been a manager on the basketball and volleyball teams back home in Illinois, so this was a pretty big deal for the 15-year-old. Chani was happy at her new school and had already made friends. She also asked Gloria to please not tell anyone about her challenges that arose from albinism. She wanted to do things on her own, and she was trying to establish independence. For Chani and her family, the joy of new beginnings would be short-lived. Just six weeks after Chani moved to Alabama, she disappeared. So let's step back in time to that long-ago evening on December 9th, 1994. It's just two weeks before Christmas, but since we're in the South, it's relatively warm, mid-60 degrees. So you can create a visual of Chani at the time. She stood about 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighed around 150 pounds, had shoulder-length white hair, and blue eyes. She wore both contact lenses and glasses. After school on that Friday, December 9th, Chani rode the bus from Eureka High School with her new team, the Benjamin Russell Lady Wildcats, to attend varsity girls basketball practice at Radney Elementary School, which was located east of Alabama Highway 9. This is the school that her team usually practiced at. Gloria explained to me that each of the teams sort of had their own separate school. So the the girls' varsity practiced at Radney Elementary. Also happening at Radney Elementary School that evening was an award ceremony for a reader's program, which brought in a large number of other students and their parents. It was out of the ordinary for Chani to have a Friday evening practice, but the following day, the team had a tournament, so the coach had added an additional Friday practice. When I spoke to Gloria, she told me there were several things that occurred that day that were not the norm. In addition to the Friday night practice, Gloria, Howard, and Levi were going to Georgia that evening after Levi finished wrestling practice. So that morning, as Gloria drove Chani to school, she let her know that Chani would have to call her brother Chris after practice to come and pick her up. Practice ended around 6 or 6.30. Parents arrived to pick up their children, and several of the girls on the team got on the school bus that took them back to the high school so they could drive their own cars home. The basketball coaches also got on the bus to return to the high school. Chani was seen standing outside Radney Elementary School waiting for a ride, though I'll also mention here that no one that evening saw her use the phone to call for a ride. And as I stated earlier, she was supposed to call her brother Chris after practice to come pick her up. Apparently, several other students asked her if she needed a ride home, but she said she already had one. And remember, this was not the days of cell phones, so she would have had to use a pay phone or a school phone to call for a ride. These moments would be the last really concrete sightings of Chani. As the night wore on and a call never came in from his sister, Chris started to get worried. He drove to the school looking for her, but Chani was nowhere to be found. He then called Gloria and Howard, who were three hours away in Georgia. They told him to call the police. So that night on December 9th, 1994, Chris Shiverdecker reported his sister missing. Howard, Gloria, and Levi returned the following morning, and police and volunteers mobilized quickly, searching for the missing 15-year-old. Both church and rescue groups organized to comb the area surrounding the Radney Elementary School. 
They focused on a 10-mile radius surrounding the place where Chanty had last been seen, honing in on creeks and near bridges. In the days following Chani's disappearance, two additional sightings came in regarding Chani's whereabouts after basketball practice. Gloria told me about one sighting, which I also read about in the paper, and this sighting was called in to her directly. A man working at a convenience store in Alex City said that he recognized Chani from the missing person posters. He said that she had come into the store on the previous Friday, December 9th, in the company of two young men. One man waited in his vehicle, which was described as a blue car. The second young man went into the store with her. Frustratingly, when police attempted to view surveillance video from the time in question, it had been erased from the videotape, and they were unable to confirm the sighting. But remember, Chani had a distinctive appearance, so it's unlikely a stranger would have confused her with someone else. Gloria found the sighting to be very believable. She said often when she picked up Chani after practice that Chani wanted to run into a store to grab a Snapple or a Diet Coke. The second sighting was by a woman who said she saw two boys with Chani at the local Walmart. Gloria believes this is a true sighting, but that it actually occurred several days before Chani went missing. Gloria explained that Chani had become friends with another boy at school who was in special needs classes, and she had gone earlier in the week with him and his brother to Walmart. The woman who had seen them at Walmart described the items they were looking at, and these were the same items that Chani had told Gloria earlier in the week that she looked at when she went to Walmart with her new friends from school. So again, this is an unconfirmed sighting, but Gloria did believe that the witness saw Chani. She simply confused the dates when she saw her. And Gloria also explained that these are two different sets of brothers that she was possibly seen with. The first set that she was with at Walmart, again, one of the boys was in a special needs class and they had become friends. Gloria had met him and they'd actually all gone to see a movie together. And this is different than the boys that it's believed Chani was at the convenience store with. Bulletins went out throughout the country, spreading word about Chani's disappearance, including to her hometown of Eureka, Illinois. However, they produced few results. Chani's family existed in a terrible limbo, afraid to hear the phone ring in case it brought bad news regarding Chani, but equally afraid as the time passed with no news of the girl's whereabouts and the possibility that something terrible had befallen her. Helicopters were also utilized in the search for Chani, including equipment that recognizes bodies and fresh graves. Those produced no findings. An additional search led by two psychics also occurred, but that too produced no results. The police were frustrated, saying they were pursuing every lead, but that they were coming up short in avenues to pursue. They considered whether Chani may have left on her own, but her family insisted she was happy in her new town and at her new school. She also didn't take any belongings or any money with her to school on the day she disappeared. Not to mention, she wasn't someone who had run away before. Gloria did mention to me when I spoke with her on the phone that investigators did seem to lean somewhat heavily towards the runaway theory. Police also considered the Shiverdecker family as potential suspects, asking them to take polygraph tests. In a January 1995 article in the Montgomery Advertiser, Chani's dad said he didn't mind taking a polygraph, but rumors that his son or wife might have killed Chani were very upsetting. 
Gloria also mentioned this when I spoke with her, stating that police requested that Chris, Channy's brother, take three polygraph tests. The suspicion directed at Chris was pretty devastating for him. I think one of the unfortunate aspects in many criminal cases is the often unwarranted focus on family members who are already distraught and going through what will likely be the worst hours of their lives. An excruciating 10 weeks would pass before any information about Channy's whereabouts emerged. When it did, it was the worst possible news. On February 24th, 1995, an anonymous call came into police, pointing investigators to the location of a nude, decomposed body at an abandoned lumber yard off of Highway 9 in Coosa County near Nixburg, Alabama. The remains, which were found 10 miles from where Channy was last seen, were conclusively identified as the missing 15-year-old. However, her cause of death could never be determined due to the advanced level of decomposition that occurred between the time that Channy was killed and when her body was found. Channy's clothes, book bag, and purse were not found with her body. She wore only her tennis shoes. Channy's body had been discarded approximately 120 yards from the highway in a wooded area located behind an abandoned mobile home, which again was on a lumber yard that was no longer in use. Police said they did not believe the anonymous caller who reported the location of Channy's body was involved in any way in her death. They said he simply didn't want to get wrapped up in the investigation. And I did read in a separate article that it was a person who was out looking at property to buy who came upon her body. Channy's clothing and backpack were never found. However, Gloria said her books and purse were discovered in the spring. They'd likely been tossed out a window off of the highway north of Alex City in Goodwater. Alexander City Police Investigator Steve Morgan worked Channy's missing persons case. However, the investigation expanded to include the Coosa County Sheriff's Office and the Alabama Bureau of Investigation. When Channy's dad should have been purchasing Christmas gifts, he was instead buying five burial plots at an Alexander City Cemetery, one for his deceased 15-year-old daughter. On Thursday, March 9, 1995, a packed memorial of more than 200 friends and family gathered to remember Shani at the Eureka United Methodist Church in her hometown of Eureka, Illinois. At the front of the church stood a table draped in white. A framed photograph of Channy stood next to a porcelain angel as well as a volleyball plaque with Channy's name. In addition to Channy's family, her fellow classmates and friends were a painful reminder of the life stolen from the 15-year-old. Seven girls, all high school sophomores, as Channy herself had been, carried two single carnations each. Some of the girls added their flowers to the table with Channy's picture, which also held a white bear holding seven silk roses. Six of the roses were red, and a single rose was yellow, representing Channy. The girls said that the bear was to be buried with Channy. Jenny Malloy, one of Channy's friends, told reporter Marlene Franks in the Woodford County Journal, quote, I'm still waiting to wake up and find out it was some sort of nightmare. The girls at her memorial grappled with Channy's death, describing it as unfair. One friend said, quote, she's never going to have a future. Another friend, Julie Knoll, added her own comment, an especially sad, albeit insightful one. She said, quote, we have to go on and face more pain, more sorrow. She doesn't have to. Channy's friend, Cynthia Schott, said, quote, the purpose of her being here was to show you what a good friend and a good daughter was. 
Reverend Paul Wallace spoke at the memorial, saying, God has the final word. We are reminded that God meant Chanty's life as a gift. Other people spoke at the memorial, including Nancy Kanaga, Chani's volleyball coach. She described Chani as a hard worker and a team player. The high school principal at Chani's former school, Leonard Savage, said, quote, It's so easy to remember Chani, so hard to forget her. Gloria also spoke, saying that she wanted people to know Chani. She described her outgoing and unstoppable personality, her close friendships, and the many things that Chani loved. She reminded Chani's friends to, quote, remember her spirit and her drive for life. And she also left the girls with a warning. Chani made a poor decision to accept a ride from someone she thought she could trust. In the short time we lived in Alabama, she did not learn who could be trusted. Reverend Wallace closed the memorial by saying, quote, Standing in the shadow of death has a way of stripping away the things that really don't matter as much as we once thought they did. I think we best serve the gift of Chani's life by celebrating that gift in each person. A year after Chani's death, her friends continued to grow closer, bound in part by the loss of their friend. They spoke fondly and vividly of Chani, remembering how she loved Pop-Tarts and how she insisted on wearing shorts even during the winter. In a December 1995 article in the Pantograph, her friend Sarah Aldrich said, quote, I think about her every day. Something usually reminds me of Chani. Perhaps only slightly less harrowing than the weeks that Chani was missing are the years that have passed with few suspects in her case. In 1997, a potential suspect emerged. Clark Allen Morris was arrested in Seattle, Washington for burglary. While in jail, he confessed on October 21st, 1997 to abducting and murdering Chani. Morris was a 34-year-old transient. He had no current address, but his most recent address was for Seattle. Morris was suspected in additional murders as well, and police were looking at him as a potential serial killer. He allegedly confessed to police while being held in the King County Jail in Washington that he'd murdered before and gotten away with it. A grand jury was assembled in 1998 in Alexander City, Alabama to consider evidence against Clark Allen Morris. The jury deliberated over several days, but ultimately concluded they needed more information to prove Morris's involvement in Chani's death. Unfortunately, that information was not to be, and eventually investigators discredited Morris's story. And I did speak to Gloria about this person, Clark Allen Morris, and she had told me that at the time of his arrest, the piece of evidence police believed he offered that proved he was the murderer was the fact that Chani was found wearing her shoes. And the investigators said they had held that back from the press so that if someone could confessed, they would know he was actually guilty. However, Gloria said that it had been printed in a newspaper article that Chani was found with her shoes on. And so this, at least in part, led to the discrediting of Morris's story. And I did try to find him in connection with other murders, and I really did not find him anywhere else in any of the newspaper articles or online. So I'm assuming, and I don't know if this is true, but I'm assuming that he was seeking attention, he was being boastful in the jail, and ultimately he had not actually committed any murders. In a December 18, 2012 article in the Woodford County Journal, Gloria said, quote, 
Over the years, there have been tips and some other things that officers thought might lead them to her killer, but every time it turned out to be a dead end. As a parent, you try to move on, but those questions are always there. You just want to know what happened. You ask yourself, who could do this and why? It's been a long time, and they have checked out everything that they have gotten, but we just hope that someone out there will see this and come forward with something that will give us some closure. Again, that was in 2012, 18 years after Chani had been murdered. Investigator Morgan, who originally worked Chani's disappearance, described Chani's unsolved murder as a case that has haunted him since the very first phone call about her going missing. Alexander City Police have not given up hope that Chani's killer will be brought to justice. In a December 2014 article in the Woodford County Journal, Alexander City Police Department Corporal Michael Howell said, quote, getting it back out there into the public may help. We welcome the public's help. If they can remember anything that they may have seen, anything that seemed odd, anything that seemed out of the ordinary, we would love to hear from them. In that same article, Gloria, Chani's stepmother, spoke about how wonderful it would be for Chani's father, Howard, to get answers regarding her murder. She said that he'd suffered from heart problems in the previous years and would love to know what became of his daughter. I also wanted to share a post that Christopher Shiverdecker, Chani's brother, had written, and it was shared on the Chani Shiverdecker Unsolved Facebook page. And I'm going to read that post now. For the past 20 years now, my family has had a difficult relationship with the holiday season. You see, on December 9th, 1994, my sister Chani Martria Shiverdecker went missing from Radney Elementary School after a girl's basketball practice, and her ultimate fate would not be known to us for almost three months. This made the Christmas of 1994 one where we had to hope, forsake despair, and suffer the ever-present feeling that we had no right to celebrate, give thanks, or share when someone so vital to us was unaccounted for. You can ask anyone that has ever been in similar circumstances and they will tell you time and time again that the worst thing is the not knowing. This is true. That season, we moved into a house with a bedroom reserved for my sister. She had presents waiting for her under the tree in the hope that she would be home by Christmas morning. Community searches were organized by local churches, and every time they were finished and we were still left not knowing, we found ourselves with the small blessing of still being able to hope. The trick to tolerating not knowing is to hope. It is as simple as that. Then February came, and the police gave us the news that Chani wasn't coming home. Eventually, the tree was taken down and the presents were moved. Her room in the house she never got to see went on to be the home of several family friends and exchange students, as if to help fill the hole left by the member of our family that would be forever missing. It seemed that hope had died. Going into the 20th Christmas since that terrible year, I am reminded and wish to remind all of you that there is still one great unknown that hangs over my family. And that is that the case of Chani Martria Shiverdecker is still unsolved. The question I hear the most from people is, Quote, did they ever catch the person who did it? And I think it is important that people know that the answer to that question is no. This means that even after all this time, we still have hope. We hope that there are people out there that may be able to help us solve this case, lead the investigation in the right direction, and to finally give us the peace of knowing.
Christopher Shiverdecker and family. That is a pretty heart-wrenching statement made by Chris, the brother who has been haunted since those very first hours after Chani went missing and who also suffered from being blamed in some regards by the public and probably by himself on some level because I think that is something that we all do. When something terrible befalls someone we love, we have this tendency to blame ourselves. So ultimately, where we are left at this point is with really not knowing what happened to Chani that night. I'm going to talk now about some of the possible theories, and I'm going to talk a little bit in depth about Gloria's theories in particular because she does have a sense of who she thinks did this crime and I'm not going to name names and I'm not going to be really specific because I've come across a lot of cases where people have suspicions and and then it turns out not to be true and the bottom line is there is not enough evidence for police to question or arrest any of these individuals so whether or not they were involved is hard to say to start with it does seem likely that Chani was picked up that night by someone she knew, and quite possibly by someone she went to school with. And the reason this makes sense is because Chani was not the type of person to get into a car with a stranger. She had a ride from her brother if she needed a ride. She was offered multiple rides from people at the school. So it's not as if she were stranded out there trying to find a ride and she willingly got into a car with someone she didn't know. Gloria believes that at some point at school that day, someone offered to give her a ride. And this may be someone who was aware that Chani's parents were going out of town, out of state, in fact, that evening, and they would not be home. So this person would know that maybe they could go back to Chani's and party, or at the very least, maybe they could go somewhere with Chani for a period of time and and no one would sound the alarm because her parents were out of town. So the suspicions that Gloria have land largely on the two boys that Chani was seen with at the convenience store. And she suspects that they may have been brothers. These are not the brothers that Chani visited Walmart with. One of these brothers drove a blue car, and he was significantly older than Chani. The younger brother did go to high school with Chani. Now, again, there's no conclusive evidence that Chani was, in fact, with these brothers that night. She may have been at that convenience store with two totally different men, and there's also the possibility she wasn't at the convenience store only because there's, there isn't anything to corroborate her being there except the eyewitness account of a man working there. So if someone offered to give Chani a ride during the school day after she was done with practice, she may not have called to let Chris or her parents know, A, because she wanted to make sure this person actually showed up to pick her up before she eliminated the need for Chris to come in and pick her up, and B, she figured she'd be arriving home shortly after practice and there was no reason to let anyone know. Gloria said that she mentioned these brothers that she has been suspicious of to the detective working on the case. But again, according to investigators, there simply wasn't enough evidence that could justify questioning them. 
So I'm not going to add any more details about them, except to say in the year since Chani has been murdered, Gloria has spoken to several people and found out additional information about these brothers' whereabouts that evening that has kind of strengthened her theory that they may have been involved in Chani's murder. Another reason that it seems likely that two people were involved in Chani's murder is because Chani was not a tiny, petite girl. She was 5'7", 150 pounds, and Gloria said she would have fought if she realized that these guys were trying to take her somewhere other than home or they were trying to do something to her. She would have put up a fight. She would have told them she was telling her dad that they were going to be in trouble. And she thinks, you know, that it's very possible that these boys took her that evening, not necessarily with the intention that they were going to murder her, which is part of the reason they felt comfortable stopping at a convenience store so that she could get a drink. But they did have some heinous intention on their mind. And Gloria thinks they, after they picked her up and went to the convenience store, they took her to another location somewhere that they knew no one would come upon them. And when they tried to do something to Chani, she fought back and they ended up killing her and then discarding her body. Because we know based on the cause of death or the lack of cause of death that Chani was not shot, she was not stabbed, that could mean a couple of things. One, it could mean whatever happened wasn't planned and the person who did this did not bring a weapon. And two, that there was more than one person to be able to subdue her and strangle her, suffocate her. I mean, we we don't know, but the ways in which you can kill someone that don't leave an obvious sign of death in an autopsy, it would be harder for a single person to do that with someone like Chani. Another element that supports the theory of these being local people or people who knew the area is that the place where Chani was dumped was really quite hidden. And Gloria even mentioned that during those horrible weeks when Chani was missing, her and her family and other searchers were in the vicinity just within a mile or two. And they had even, I think, searched, I don't know if it was an abandoned church, I can't remember offhand, but they'd found you know, old pairs of underwear and all of these different things. But the place where Chani was actually dumped was really quite hidden away. So it's not, you know, out in the open on the side of the road or right at the edge of the woods on the side of the road. It it was tucked back in and it would likely not be a place that someone just passing through town would know about. They would probably have to be familiar with the area and be aware that they could go there and not be seen. Unfortunately, there really are not any concrete suspects and there haven't been much in the way of tips over the years. So the question remains, who killed Chani Shiverdecker? The explanation that makes the most sense to me is that she got into a vehicle with someone she knew well enough to accept a ride home. A stranger could have abducted her, but no one witnessed an abduction. She was seen at a convenience store with two young men, and she was not in duress when that occurred. She was also not someone who could have been easily abducted if the perpetrator was alone. Chani's basketball clothes, which would have likely included shorts and a t-shirt, were never found. This was not her uniform. They were just her practice clothes. 
Her canvas flower print backpack was also never found. I don't have an exact description of the backpack, but Gloria explained that it looks a lot like the pattern that is on a shirt Chani is wearing in a picture, which I will share um, on the page where I add the show notes. So if you want to see that picture, you'll be able to see her shirt and know that her backpack looked something like that. Chani had white hair, so the person who did this may have had white hair in their vehicle after the crime occurred. So again, we're thinking about someone who had any of these items. Also, this person or these people may have acted strangely in the days following Chani's disappearance, possibly even leaving town if they lived in the Alexander City, Alabama area. They may have had a noticeable interest in Chani's case in the weeks and months after she vanished. And one of the things that Gloria said near the end of our call was, quote, it might be a small thing, but any little thing might be the thing that can take care of all this. That's the place where Chani's case is at. They are grasping at straws. They are looking for anything. So if you are familiar with this case, if you remember something from that period of time that seems unusual, if you heard rumors about who may have done it, there are definitely instances where those rumors turn out to be true. So if you have any information regarding the unsolved murder of Channy Shiverdecker, which occurred on December 9th, 1994, please call Alexander City Police at 256-329-6751. And I just want to say one more time, please consider sharing this episode. The power in podcasts like this comes down to to people being willing to share the information and the hope that that information makes it to someone who knows something. Thank you again for listening to today's episode. Thank you to Gloria for speaking with me about Chani and to all of the listeners have a great day. If you have any comments or case suggestions, please send me an email at bitterendingspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find out all of the resources for this episode and read the show notes and more. Visit my website at www.bitterendingspod.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Bitter Endings Podcast. The Bitter Endings Podcast is sponsored by My Fiction Novels. The Northern Michigan Asylum series are novels that braid elements of haunting and murder mystery, and they're all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com in audio format if you are an audible listener, as well as in ebook and paperback. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bitter Endings and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing to this podcast and also leaving a review. Thanks so much and have an amazing and a safe day. I just want to take a quick minute to also acknowledge the music played in the Bitter Endings podcast. This song is called Disease Tree by Noya Sakamata.